So who's enjoyed Christmas? Yeah. It's, been, it's been great, hasn't it? And um, when you think about the way Christmas is celebrated in Australia, it's a rather unusual mix. It's, a, it's really a conflation um, of multiple narratives all immersed into one. If you were to ask any preschooler to try and dissect what is pagan, what is capitalist, what is Christian, they would probably give you a very mystified look. For, for most preschoolers, they are entirely comfortable with the idea of angels singing carols around a pagan symbol of infertility while they ra wait for some Scandinavian saint to climb down their chimney, eat the bread and cookies, or milk and cookies, and leave behind a whole bunch of presents. Is that a comfortable narrative for a preschooler? And they don't really understand that there is this eclectic mix of narratives from all over the world and from every generation that is kind of being melded into one, into what we call an Australian Christmas. Peter? I think pagan is misunderstanding. It doesn't mean anti-Christian. Um, pagan was what people were. It means from the village before Christ came on the scene 2,000 years ago. They believed in like the sun and things. Yes. And it doesn't mean they're anti-Christian because it was way before us what the people were close to nature. They saw God from nature. Yeah. And I think paganism means from the village actually. It doesn't mean anti-Christian. Anti that, that may be true and certainly Constantine in the 4th century saw that there were a lot of pagan narratives which he could um, attribute Christian meanings and try and see if he could reunite a, a crumbling Roman Empire. And um, yeah, but we do have like symbols of Christmas trees which are evergreen and have more to do with the winter solstice than they do to the birth of Jesus in the fields of Bethlehem sometime in April 2000 odd years ago. But yeah, Christmas has become really anything we want it to be, hasn't it? And for some of us it's about family, for some of us about feasting, for some of us about capitalism and participating in the so-called $25 billion week of spend that Australia puts into, into the event each week. I suspect most people here today, whether they like it or don't like it, have not been unaffected by the fact that we live at the time of Christmas and that for most of you, you either got a gift, received a gift or know somebody who did. Would that be true? And one of the myths that I always think is quite amusing at Christmas is the, the, the ubiquitous Christmas card with the three kings from the east who have come to visit Jesus. And we sing the Christmas carol, don't we? We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar. But for those of you who know the Bible record, were they kings? No. no. Were they from the Orient? Yes. They were from the east, weren't they? Yeah. Um, sorry? Yeah, so, so there's some, some of it true, some of it not so true, but what we do know is that the Bible tells us that there were wise men that came from the east bearing gifts and brought them to Jesus. I, it's not, in, it's not um, said in the scripture, is it? But we kind of, I guess, in our own um, narrative stories, recognise that because there were three gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh, that it makes it simple to teach children that there was one king bearing each gift. And so we've kind of brought into the biblical narrative a little bit of cultural narrative and it's become a very, very powerful symbol of what Christmas is about. Why such a powerful symbol? Perhaps because the capitalists see in it this idea that gold, frankincense and myrrh were not gifts of insignificant value and if they can encourage us through the Christmas story to be more generous and spend more then the capitalist economy will benefit from that in the giving of gifts. And I know um, many of my patients have been bemoaning over the last few weeks that Christmas is a time where they feel a moral obligation to buy gifts they can't afford for people that they don't like. And Christmas for some people is not necessarily the high point of the year when it comes to balancing their credit cards and balancing their budgets. There are of course parents and grandparents who compete amongst each other to be the giver of the best gift. And uh, if you Google the most expensive gifts available on the internet today, you can come up with all sorts of interesting lists of what people want to give. But before we get too saintly and condemn the excesses of the capitalist world in which we live, and um, talk about the indulgence of entitled juveniles who carry around with pouts and frowns on Christmas morning because their box of crayons wasn't really the iPad that they were longing to get. We need to recognise that Christmas for Christians, if we do accept that it's a cultural phenomenon and it's a thing, 
is attached to a God who loved this world so much that he gave his most precious gift. God is the giver of good gifts. Would you agree? And God was not stingy or frugal when he comes to give. He gives all that he can. He gives the best that he has. In fact, if we were to distill the biblical message down to its most essential essence, we find that the story of God is reasonably simple. God is love, and love cannot exist in isolation. Love flourishes in community, in connection, and love in community is manifest by a willingness to reach beyond self-interest and to invest in the benefit of others. Is that what Christianity is about? God loves, God gives. And so while we can be reasonably confident that we're not going to get dogmatic, that there were three kings, there may have been less, there may have been more, there is something about reaching out and going beyond our own comfort zone, traversing afar to bear gifts to benefit others, that is resonant with the essence of the story of God. This baby lying in a manger to casual observation, was the recipient of incredible gifts of value. Gold, frankincense and myrrh, these gifts in some sense symbolised economic value, aesthetic value and restorative value. They addressed for Jesus and his very poor family the ability of them to trade in the economy, the ability to enjoy the aesthetics and the pleasures that come from the scent of their frankincense and the ability to bring about physical restoration and healing through the gift of myrrh. But looking deeper at the story, we see in the helpless babe perhaps the greatest gift that has ever been given. You know, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, spend a little bit of time talking about the narrative of Jesus' birth. But the Gospel of John, which is my favourite for various reasons, launches in its early verses into an ontological, philosophical defence of the nature of God. In the beginning, John says, was not the manger or the inn or the donkey or the straw or the hay or angels singing. In the beginning was the word. The communication from God to us. And this communication of God was God indeed. And this word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen the glory of God. The glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This helpless babe lying there in Bethlehem was not the recipient of gifts, but the greatest of gifts. God became us. He immersed himself in our mess and he has injected into our story an increase of our value. He has given us the ability to become the fragrance of beauty and through us to bring healing and restoration to others. Jesus came down here to heal the sin problem to mend all that has been lost through broken relationships. And he offers us the gift of eternal life. You know, as a young child, I sometimes got Christmas all wrong. I thought I was from a very poor family. But as an adult, I realised I just had a frugal mother. My parents always made sure that my physical needs were met. And I was blessed in my childhood to be given a very expensive trumpet and a very expensive guitar. But believe it or not, as a child growing up, I never had a new bike. The best thing my parents gave me was a unicycle. I guess they thought they saved by only having to buy one wheel. But for my mother, Christmas was always practical. We received things that were useful, or in many cases before it became trendy, recycled gifts. She was a teacher and her students would bring her presents on the last day of school which she would re-wrap and reissue as presents to all those that she wanted to think we, she cared about. I remember my nana was of the same persuasion and the trauma of receiving a knitted jumper in the cheapest beige wool available at Kmart. It wasn't enough that I was f- psychologically 
injured in anticipation of the scorn I would receive from my friends by sleeves that were too long and cuffs that loosened at the first wash. But it was the horrific hay fever that I had to endure when I put this thing on. It was so filled with dust mites. I'm lucky to have survived childhood. <laughs> I understand the petulant face on the screen and, and, and the trauma that's received when a committed vegan is given home harvested honey. <laughs> we all know the petulant look of the child that had aspirations of a great gift and received something that was in the family budget that fails to meet expectations. And in the story of Jesus, the gifts of the Magi were not the default response of the Jews. The Magi recognised in this babe born in Bethlehem a divine king, somebody sent from heaven to bless humanity. But the frightening reality is that when Jesus turned up, the Jews had the petulant sulk of a small child who thought he was getting an iPad but ended up with crayons. <laughs> He came to his own, and the Bible tells us that his own received him not. The remarkable and embarrassing truth of the Christmas story is that those who should have been the most excited at the gift of Jesus instead wanted to kill him from his very birth. Jesus, whose mission it was to clear up the misunderstanding this world had about God, was in fact perhaps the most misunderstood being that has ever walked this planet. And for the Jews and to those who Jesus came, they did not see in Jesus merit, value or worth. They were hoping for a different kind of Messiah. And on behalf of humanity, they took Jesus as he turned up and cast him aside. But not everybody failed to recognise in Jesus the greatest gift that we have been given. There were some that appreciated his mission. There were some then as there are now who needed relational healing more than they needed material prosperity. There have always been those who have understood that the greatest gifts are gifts of identity, gifts of connection, gifts of purpose and that material blessings will decay, fade and are soon superseded. Saints, today we are here in this church because we have come to worship, to share together that we are part of Jesus' new story. You see, the Jesus cast aside, the Jesus crucified, the Jesus condemned to Joseph's no tomb is no longer there. And if you are to go to Jerusalem to find the mausoleum of Jesus, you will not find him. He is risen. And the gift of his incarnation is but a foretaste of his eternal commitment to love and to give. God has not stopped giving. In fact, the story of Jesus is not a measure of the extent of his love, but rather the intent of his love. It does not measure in a point in time all that God has to give. It merely indicates that this is who he is. And the Bible tells us in Romans 8 and verse 32 that he who did not spare his son but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? We will be disappointed in God if we fail to understand him. What did the Jews want from a Messiah? They wanted material prosperity. They wanted immediate relief from political adversity and persecution. And Jesus came to play the long game. He did not promise any of us freedom from challenge, from adversity, from physical or emotional suffering. He promised us instead that he would finish this earth's story with a chapter that had fully dealt with the problem of sin and granted opportunity to all who chose to believe in him. God forbid that any one of us, because we didn't get the present the way we thought we wanted it, need think that God does not love us. God has promised us gifts that are beyond our wildest expectations. 
we often mistakenly think that we would be better off if we lived live, uh, when Jesus was physically present. And in some sense I can understand how great it would have been to live when Jesus was on the earth. Who wouldn't have liked to have seen him calm the storm on Galilee or to raise Lazarus from the dead or feed 5,000 with a, five loaves and two fishes? These demonstrations that God had the power to take on sin and beat it at every turn, this would have been an exciting thing for us to witness. But God has promised us that as Jesus physically was removed from us, that we are not left without the presence of the divine. God has given us freely the Holy Spirit, the gift of his presence to all who will ask. God is generous. He has granted to us everything we need to find and fulfill our destiny. You know, God might not bring me a Tesla Roadster. He may not heal my mother of cancer. He may not pay off my million dollar mortgages. But everything that is necessary for life and godliness is mine in the gift of Jesus. In writing to the church, Peter, who was perhaps one of the last apostles to, to be in communication with, with the early church, he wrote this. He said, God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain in life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. When we accept Jesus, the gift that has, given, has been given us from heaven, we accept that his commitment to us is not just to start a journey by rebranding us as his children, but we accept that Jesus has called us to a whole new way of life. Peter continues and says, God has granted to us, God has gifted to us, God has given us precious and great promises so that through these gifts you can become participants in his divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Is the story of this world somewhat fractured and somewhat broken? As we look out into a godless, secular, capitalist world, are we filled with, I guess, symbols of hope and encouragement that we are on a positive trajectory and that within a few short years everything will be rosy? I think as Christians we fully understand that we live in a world that is broken and that thin veneers are being painted and, and, and masquerades are being created and shimmers and mirages are being erected that would try and, and deceive us into thinking that somehow we can have a semblance of sanity and security in this world that is full of sin and death. But God has gifted us great and precious promises that we can become partakers of a new story, a different story, a story that is not destined to end in oblivion and hopeless despair, but a story that is destined to end in eternal hope and eternal life. God has given to us precious and very great promises. I want to ask you, how many of you have at home presents that you haven't opened yet? I tend to find that the default human behaviour is that if somebody gives you something wrapped, you want to know what's inside. Would you agree? You take the ribbons and you take the wrapping paper and you take the sticky tape and you take the string and you rip through them and you shred them because you want to see what's inside. And as remarkable as it is, Sometimes I wonder if there is such a thing as a divine Santa Claus, if he does not sit in heaven with some sense of mystery and wonder why it is that the gifts that he has given so generously can at some times remain unwrapped and uninvestigated. God has given us promises. He has promised us life. He has promised us forgiveness. He has promised us repentance. He has promised us power. He has promised that if we persevere, we will prosper. His promises are precious. His promises are great. And as tons of wrapping paper are carted off to be recycled, and as already some of our Christmas presents have been relegated to the pile of disinterest and lack of usefulness, I want to challenge you this year to take the time to unwrap the great and precious promises that God has given to you 
as a gift. God has promised to come again. Believe it and live a different story because of it. God has promised us his Holy Spirit. Allow that spirit to convince and convict. God has promised us joy and peace and love and faith. Spend time this year reorienting your perspective and your priorities so that what is valuable to God becomes valuable to you. And God has promised that if we abide in him, we will bear fruit. As the new year draws upon us, and as Christmas is fading from our distant horizon, my challenge to the Church of Byron Bay for 2020 is that we recognise that God does not give in a moment of time. God is a giver, a giver of all good gifts, a generous beneficiary who wants to immerse himself in our story with the gift of precious and exceedingly great promises. I want to challenge you to unwrap them to investigate them, to treasure them, to claim them, to make them your own. Let us in 2020 get closer to God. Let us allow him to hold us more tightly. God is faithful. He has promised. He will deliver. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you gave us Jesus. And Lord, if you would not spare your own son but freely give him up for us all, how will you not with him also give us all things. Your generosity is amazing and I pray Lord that we would not leave the gift of your precious promises unwrapped and uninvestigated. May we instead integrate, incorporate, include them in our story. Lord make a difference in us, for us and through us for your glory. We know this is what you want and Lord we want it too. And we ask you, Lord, to be real in our story in 2020. In Jesus' name, amen.